Many game franchises have multiple entries or sequels, and every so often, one of them comes along and kills off or severely damages an entire franchise. Here are 10 examples of that. Just fair warning, this video is a little bit of a bummer. Let's get started off with number 10 and talk about Medal of Honor. This is a now classic World War II shooter franchise. I mean, it was like kickstarted by freaking Steven Spielberg. From the PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2 era, the Medal of Honor games lived a wonderful life. They were incredibly fun, cinematic, first-person shooter war games well before you had a solid Call of Duty campaign or anything like that. Medal of Honor was crushing it with score by Michael Giacchino, who is now famous for doing like superhero movies, to really incredible, still memorable depictions of stuff you'd see in war movies like Saving Private Ryan, like storming the beaches of Normandy. Yeah, Medal of Honor did that and they crushed it in video game form. From the Pacific theater to Nazi intrigue, all kinds of stuff, they really had it going on for a while. And then, it seems like when Call of Duty and Battlefield really started to pop off, Medal of Honor kind of fell to the wayside. But around 2010, it's when EA really tried to revitalize things and kick Medal of Honor into the modern age, so to speak, with 2010's Medal of Honor and then 2012's Medal of Honor Warfighter. And the problem with these games is that they were half-assed and just so, so painfully generic. Now, they had their moments, mind you, Medal of Honor Warfighter, which I do remember reviewing back in the day, not for game ranks, but somewhere, uh, actually had some surprisingly good driving sections, but otherwise, these modern revamped Medal of Honor games were like totally all style, no substance. On the surface, they looked pretty good, but once you actually got to playing one, there were so many other games just doing this stuff better at the time, and they totally ate Medal of Honor's lunch. 2012 had Medal of Honor Warfighter come and go and quickly be forgotten, and we hadn't heard anything about Medal of Honor since. Then, I mean, to be fair, in 2010, there was Medal of Honor Above and Beyond, the Oculus VR game uh, by Re spawn of all people, but that didn't necessarily take off. And after that, and considering this was a pretty expensive VR game to make, we don't know if the Medal of Honor franchise is ever really going to see a resurgence. I mean, nothing is ever really dead. They could bring it back and drag it out in a couple more years and maybe do it right. But for now, Medal of Honor is definitely sleeping with the fishes. Next over at number nine, there was Ninja Gaiden 3. Oh man, do you remember this one? Leading up to it, it seemed like it was gonna be pretty awesome. All those cool new weapons, the kind of visual style, the game's cover art, like it just seemed really cool. People were obviously really excited specifically because the last two Ninja Gaiden games were great. They were incredibly challenging, really tight games. I mean, we still talk about Ninja Gaiden and Ninja Gaiden Black all the time here if you watch Game Ranks every day. Man, the lead up to Ninja Gaiden 3 was so exciting and then when this thing dropped in 2012 it got a lot of bad reviews i famously remember a really crushing one from giant bomb where they gave it like a two out of five stars overall nobody was really happy with it i remember personally after it just felt like regular old generic video game stuff and along with that the game just lost a lot of its identity it felt really handholdy a lot of people had built it as just kind of button mashy and stupid the game had your typical quick time events which were popular at the time and just something was really missing. The soul of Ninja Gaiden here wasn't quite right. And again, it's just so jarring because the first two Ninja Gaiden games were so tight. Those were solid video game ass video games with challenge, secrets, nuance, and Ninja Gaiden 3 just kind of felt like a cheap clone, a cheap knockoff. Now they then tried fixing it with the Razor's Edge re-release, but for most people it was way too little, way too late. Oh, uh, and then after that, I mean, are we even going to get into this? They put out Ninja Gaiden Yaiba, and because like that was even worse. Technically, that wasn't like a main entry in the series, but still, it definitely didn't hurt things. Really, Ninja Gaiden 3 was where a lot of things seemingly died. I still think the original two games, and I mean the classic franchise before it, are still good enough that eventually we might see something again, but as of right now, Ninja Gaiden is kind of dead. And it pains me to say that, like it just doesn't feel right. Next over at number eight, we have Command and Conquer 4, which if you ask certain people, they say it was kind of the last gasp of the good series. I mean, Command and Conquer as a brand still exists today. They roll it out for certain things, but Command and Conquer 4 was the last 
numbered entry, and it wasn't that great. They really kind of changed up the whole resource gathering thing in favor of more like managing and capturing different control points, and it, it just didn't feel the same, and it seems like it didn't for a lot of people. That being said, it's an okay game. If you look at reviews, you know, it's got a lot of sevens across the board. Not a total complete disaster or anything like that, but I feel like there's a lot we can dive into with just like the main Command & Conquer games, uh, how the Red Alert games change things up. Like there's a lot of nuances here, but ultimately the bottom line is that four was just four. And then too many people, the RTS genre started to kind of lose steam, at least with mainstream popularity. They're still out there. People really play them and love them, but they don't quite pop off in terms of mainstream sales like they used to. And I think EA unfortunately realized that they're always the first to bail on stuff. And in this case, they kind of bailed on Command and Conquer. Next over at number seven, we have Castlevania Lords of Shadows 2. Now this released in 2014, and it's actually technically like the last new entry in the series in almost 10 years. And that sucks because they were kind of onto something with the original, I mean, depending on who you ask. It definitely took a lot of stuff and threw it to the wayside from classic Castlevania games, but it was a cool refresh. It was very of the time, kind of a God of War style game, but with cool vampires and the Belmonts and all that stuff you expect. But Castlevania Lord of Shadows 2 kind of took it even further with you playing as Dracula, with you being the bad guy. And that was something that ended up being a cool twist in the first game. And then in the second game, it kind of went hokey. It kind of jumped the shark a little bit. Uh, there's parts where it's in a modern world and it just very much was more a video game of the time, a 2014 game, you know, cheesy cutscenes, over the top characters, quick time events. I personally like that stuff, but not always for Castlevania. And while it was cute for Lord of Shadows, uh, it was not as good for the second one. It didn't review as well as the first game, and ultimately I think that coupled with the fact that Konami was just being Konami at the time and really were kind of stepping away from games, that was it. Castlevania, I don't think is dead forever. I think we're gonna see more of it soon. I really hope so. I really think it's time for this thing to return full speed ahead, but I guess we're just gonna have to wait and see. Next over at number six, we have Dead Rising 4. Now let's roll the clock back a little bit. The original Dead Rising was revolutionary. It was just so cool and creative and a really good spin on an almost like George Romero style zombie game uh, with a good Capcom Japanese spin to it. It was creative, it was challenging, it was stress inducing, and it was also technically very impressive. For a lot of people, if you ask some of us, that first game was truly special and uh, the series never really quite reached the same height since. It was all downhill. Now, the second one kind of continued the thing, added some things, and it was all right. But then by three, the game started to lose its identity. So 2016's Dead Rising 4 was supposed to be kind of like the comeback kid. You were once again playing as Frank, the beloved classic character character and it had kind of a shopping mall Christmas time spin like you weren't just in a shopping mall there was a lot more to it but still it seemed like it was gonna have some callbacks to the first one and be a good time unfortunately though uh, the game was not received very well at all now full disclosure I played it I thought it was alright I didn't think it was the best in the series but I certainly didn't hate it by any means uh, but for most people they were checked out of the series at this point I guess completely lost faith I think that ultimately the bottom line is that they just kept watering down what did rising was from game to game and by four it had really dried up i mean it was another open world ish game uh in a sea of them uh when a lot of other games were kicking ass that year i mean 2016 was the year that like hitman started to kind of roll out the new hitman uh, doom was blowing people away so dead rising just kind of came like a fart in the wind ultimately it seemingly flopped for capcom and that's really all we've heard about dead rising since that was 2016 we're pretty far out from that i expect good old frank west to be dragged out for something at some point but not a new mainline game anytime soon Next over at number five, we have Fear 3. Now, let's roll it back again. The original Fear was absolutely revolutionary. It was an incredibly tense, technically impressive first person shooter with compelling enemies, some challenge, and also just, it was surprisingly scary. It had some really, really good scares to it. Things kind of continued with Fear 2, but at that point, the developer publisher had really smelled the money and Fear 3 released in 2011, and really it was a shadow of its former self. If you 
you compare Fear 3 to the first game, it's like being on a different planet. Fear 3 just was very much of the time, a very 2011-ass game with corny cutscenes, weird cheesy characters, dumb over-the-top moments, uh, shoehorned co-op elements that, yeah, you can say that some of those elements were actually kind of creative, but still, it wasn't really what Fear was. And bottom line, it wasn't scary at all. I don't really know what they were thinking with this game to just go so far in a different direction and after being like, oh, that's what people like. You just totally flip the franchise on its head. OK, it wasn't like a creative risk or anything. It felt totally half assed. And interestingly enough, the game actually has OK reviews. If you look at the Metacritic, I mean, like the review scores are eh, OK. Uh, and the user scores, the actual fan scores are much lower. People were really burned by this one, and uh, I don't know if we're gonna see fear ever again. That was just like a special point in time. Man, that original fear game is just magic. Now down to number four, oh, don't get me started on this one. I take this one extremely personally. It's Sim City. The 2013 game just simply titled Sim City was kind of like the harbinger of what was to come with the problems with modern games and specifically a lot of the stuff that EA pulled. The lead up to Sim City 2013 felt big. The screenshots, the videos, everything coming out, the game looked absolutely massive and incredible, and it seemed like Maxis and EA were really going for it. It was seemingly going to be more dynamic, more detailed, uh, with more zoning, way more options, uh, just a kind of different gameplay style, a whole new engine. And like critically, at face value, some critics thought it was all right, but unfortunately, once it actually released to mainstream audiences, uh, the game hit a lot of problems. It was technically an absolute mess. It was buggy, it was messy, it was all over the place, and it also was one of the earlier games that were considered always online. And it was a game that you'd pretty much be playing by yourself, but EA wanted you to be connected to the internet. And the problem was, when SimCity launched, there were a bunch of network outages. So it was just kind of like a huge perfect storm disaster. There was tons of crashing, you'd be sitting around waiting for the game to load, to connect to EA servers, uh, people were actually losing their saves, and it was just like a disaster launch. If you think modern game release launches are bad, uh, SimCity 2013 really kind of paved the way. This was like an early games as a service game. They wanted you online, they wanted you playing, and they wanted to keep updating the game constantly and keep you playing SimCity forever. And you know what? That's admirable, but it didn't hit. Technically, it was way too early for this type of content delivery. And ultimately, other developers showed how to do it right. I mean, the City Skyline games and all their expansions are great. They have a great player base, a community, people that buy into these things because it's done right. SimCity 2013 wasn't. And at this point now, uh, what happened after this one? Technically a section of Maxis closed down in 2015 and that was cited for the reason. And SimCity now at this point is kind of just reduced to mobile game whateverness. Whateverness, I don't know. That whateverness is SimCity 2013 if you ask us. Next over at number three, we have Saints Row. Yeah, the 2022 reboot was a pretty rough game. Uh, we reviewed it, we put out a before you buy video, and we were not fans. It was technically an absolute mess, but also it lost so much of the humor and charm that the original games had. Say what you will about them, some people love them, some people hate them, some people like the early ones, some people like the later ones, but Saints Row 3 tried to make all those people happy and uh, ultimately made none of them happy. The game was absolutely completely lifeless, devoid of charm. It had a cool city, but the stuff you did in it wasn't very fun, it was glitchy, and all the characters that you hung out with were shockingly annoying. The game very quickly, publicly, failed to meet expectations of the holding company uh, Embracer Group, and uh, after that, Volition, the developers who had been developing the games since the beginning, got absorbed into parts of Gearbox Entertainment. And it's worth pointing out that Saints Row at a point had like a 60 on Metacritic and like a two and a half on user score. And credit to the developers, they actually supported it post-launch. They put out a little bit of stuff, but ultimately nobody cared. It's such a shame. Because like I said, whether you like the early ones, whether you like the later ones when they went totally crazy, the Saints Row games were special. They were cool for a lot of people for a variety of different reasons, and Saints Row 2022 seemingly will quickly be forgotten by most people. Hey, if you had fun with it, that's you. We're not gonna judge you, but it doesn't seem like Volition is making another one anytime soon, and they were good developers for a very long time, and it's a shame. OK, 
Okay, back in the set. From here on out, observe and report. Now, coming down to number two, Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. Yeah, that was the last one. When was the last time you thought about Marvel vs. Capcom? When was the last time you thought about Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite? Well, the sixth mainline entry in the series, uh, which was released in 2017, just pissed off a lot of players. And there was just a lot of bad PR floating around about it. I mean, specifically with what we've talked about with a lot of games in this video, uh, a lot of the core elements of Marvel vs. Capcom were diluted, watered down, stuff was taken away. And ultimately the game was considered playing it safe. Now, as someone who's not an experienced fighting game fan, I found it kind of just cool to pick up and play and punch some people. But the hardcore fighting game community, man, these games live and die by those people. And if they're not happy, that's it for the game. And that was the case with Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. Not to mention all the other stuff that they pulled with this, uh, like certain locked characters, microtransaction stuff. I believe a really crappy collector's edition that a lot of people felt they got ripped off. There's a lot to this one in the news cycles, but ultimately the game just kind of came and went. And that's how these go. Are we gonna see another Marvel vs. Capcom at any point? I don't know. It seems like Marvel is really down to clown with some cool video games again. So maybe, but it has certainly been a while Marvel vs. Capcom has been dead since Infinite. Now down to number one, we have Driver 3, or as I like to call it, Driv 3R. Yes, this was the time where we were putting the numbers in the titles of the games and movies. This was very normal at the time, if I'm being totally honest. But still, Driver 3 followed up a pretty fantastic series. The original game was completely unique for the original PlayStation, and Driver 2 kind of oh, introduced some like open world, get out of your car type elements, and they really felt like they were onto something. But after that, the rise of Grand Theft Auto came, and and Driver 3 really was kind of chasing at that game's heels. There was a time when we had like Grand Theft Auto Vice City, but then also 2004's Driv 3R. And I mean, if you compare the two, yikes. I mean, where Driver is a little bit more realistic and like a little bit more gritty with some cool car mechanics and physics and stuff like that, uh, it was still a total mess. I mean, the shooting, the third person, anytime you were on foot as Tanner, it was totally lame. The game was a technical mess and a lot of people didn't really care and Grand Theft Auto ultimately ate its lunch. As a longtime fan of the Driver series since the original game, I forced myself to really like Driver 3. I still think there are some redeeming elements to it, but ultimately it didn't do enough to really blow away mainstream audiences. And it was a technical mess. Like if you go back and play it now, it's like unplayable almost. Now, to be fair, the Driver series did continue after this. We had the great Driver game that like took place in the 70s. We had the really underrated Driver San Francisco, but nothing really reached the height of those original Driver games. And Driver 3 kind of kicked off what would be a very, very slow years long decline to the point where now, we're probably not gonna see anything from Driver ever again. Again, I wanna point out, Driver San Francisco is very cool. It is totally different. They changed up the series, but it's a unique driving game that you should still consider checking out. And you should especially check it out because it might be the last Driver game. So those are some games that killed whole video game franchises, at least in some way, shape, or form. Now, let us know what you think in the comments about this video, because to be frank, there are a lot more examples that we couldn't fit in this video, and you probably have your own suggestions in the comments. So hit us up and we'll make a part two. Now, if you just like talking games with us, just yapping every day, clicking the like button's all you gotta do. It really helps us out. And if you're new, consider subscribing because we put out videos every single day. But as always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.